So I'm gonna find out about this thing called the CLNR, the Customer-Led Network Revolution. What does that mean? Well, luckily, I'm gonna meet someone called Professor Phil Taylor, who knows all about it. So this is a very exciting room. I can tell that there's a lot going on in here, but can you give me the sort of basic background motivation for the whole project? Yeah, absolutely. So in the UK and internationally, there's a big drive towards making the low carbon transition. We've signed up to an 80% reduction of carbon emissions uh, by 2050, and that's a an extremely change. challenging uh, target. And if you look at the pathways that the experts have put out there, there are multiple pathways to reach that uh, carbon reduction, but almost all of them require the electricity supply grid and network to be decarbonised. So what we need to do is get the building stock insulated and efficient and move the heat and transport demand onto the electricity network whilst uh, simultaneously decarbonising that electricity supply system. So the idea is that what we're going to need to do is go to a very high level of renewables to clean fossil fuels and nuclear in a future energy mix. And the key thing there is that a lot of the renewables are small scale and are located where the energy source is prevalent, not yeah. necessarily where the demand is required. Yeah. So you need a network, a national, international grid that can distribute that power around to the load centres, do it in an efficient way and become an enabler of that low carbon transition. Right. The problem with that is that that network wasn't designed for that. Yeah. A lot of it is 50 years old. And therefore, we're left with a choice of do we rewire the UK, rewire the grid, the yeah. overhead line, and Europe as well, and I mean, Europe yeah. replace everything yeah. at hundreds and hundreds of billions of pounds cost to us all, or do we try to come up with a smarter grid where we sweat the assets, make them work harder for us, use that legacy infrastructure, and still enable the low carbon transition? Right. And that's what people call smart grids. Right. right. And the target is then by 2050, it's an 80% reduction from from yeah, what year is it from a few years ago, yeah, wasn't it? it? Is, yeah. But so, so far we've gone up. <laughs> yeah. So we're not doing too well yet. Not doing too well just yet. But yeah. uh, there are huge uh, amounts, a huge capacity of offshore wind yeah. in the pipeline at the moment that are consented and. Uh, people are starting to construct, and I think once all that comes online, we'll see quite a, a big change. Right. So what you're so then what you're trying to do now then is is find out technologies that that can make the grid work more efficiently, more effectively, presumably both ways as well, because that's one of the confusing things when people hear about solar panels. They go, what, you mean my electricity can go the other way? You know, it's something we're not used to. That's right, yeah. So the original grid was a little bit like the Roman uh, aqueducts, the water system the flow of water downhill it was a little it's a little bit like that in electricity grids traditionally with power flowing from high voltages to low voltages but now in the smart grid what we've got to be able to do is have bi-directional power flow yeah. sometimes we'll be having power moving from low voltage up to high voltage right. and around the grid and that represents a challenge if you imagine we've got millions of electric vehicles millions of small renewable generators and the amount of power they produce or consume is determined by people's behavior everyday patterns and also by the weather. Yeah. So you're experimenting with all the potential technology that could be in the home. That's right. In the future uh, yes. uh, and to see how, is that, is that really to see how it interacts, how, what does what, when, how? That's right, yeah. And, how, and it's about the dynamics as well, what happens when we've got a dynamically changing output from a wind turbine mm -hmm. and at the same time we're charging a battery and uh, running an air source heat pump. Right. What does that do to the network? What does it do to the power quality that we uh, receive as customers? So what we've done here is we've built our own, if you like, smart grids playground, right. where we can pull every lever and press every button and control and observe everything. But it's also fascinating because when we talked to the National Grid and they were talking about their, their, their holy grail is, is sort of grid level storage, as in gigawatts yes. of yes. storage. But actually, if you had 10 million homes with some storage, enough yes. to run the house for a couple of days, yes. that is grid level storage in, in, a, in a network. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think really in the future, what's likely to happen is we have a mixture. We have a mixture of distributed small scale storage. It could be dedicated storage like we've yeah. got here, or it could be storage in the form of an electric vehicle as we've got uh, connected to the, to the network here as well. And then maybe some strategically placed large scale storage. The traditional approach has been to say, let demand do it exactly what it wants right. and let's schedule generation to chase that demand if you like right whereas i think what we're saying now is that maybe we need to flip that yeah. and say schedule the generation and let it run in the lowest carbon mix possible yeah. and then modify the demand to match 
the yes. current generation mix. And very often the kind of the, the solutions to kind of big problems, national problems like this, yes. this big company and this big power station and this government. But actually what this is really about is you and your home that's can right. actually make, are, are a vital part of this. Yes. And it's actually everybody, if everybody generated a little bit of electricity, yeah. then, the, then the demand from big power stations, there's only one thing that's going to be, it's going to go down. You know, that's we right. don't need as much yeah. from one big coal burning place. So it's empowering the general public yeah. to take part in the low carbon transition. I think the key thing, though, we've talked a lot about consumption and production. The other thing I think is very important is demand reduction and insulating right. homes yeah. adequately. If you put solar panels on your roof, but your house is pathetically insulated, yeah. that's not really wonderful. Really, the, the step one, I think, is to make sure the home is it's adequately insulated, yeah. is energy efficient, that you're using low energy appliances. Then you can start to introduce the low carbon technologies. Yeah. I think it's that way round is how I would advise it. So the task of reducing our carbon output by 80% by 2050, I mean, that's pretty substantial. So, and it requires a whole range of things that we've got to do. Uh, the Green Deal is part of it. I mean, we've got to make our homes much more energy efficient, much better insulation, much better windows and doors to stop drafts coming in and out. But also microgeneration in the home, things like solar panels or wind or uh, geothermal heating or air source heat pumps, those sort of things, all requiring electricity or producing electricity. And where does that electricity go? It has to go into the grid. Well, we need to make the grid smarter. So then. It, then we're faced again with the choice of we learned today we could spend hundreds of billions of pounds rewiring the whole of the UK or we could make what we've got now much more efficient much smarter which also involves things like smart meters and smart grid data processing and all that incredibly complicated stuff that the really clever people at Durham University are working out how to do and that I believe is the future of energy next time on fully charged we're heading east to visit Mazda city the city of the future.